if you've taken even introductory level economics or business classes, which I'm sure many of you have, this business cycle isn't going to be anything exciting or new to you. Um, but I do like to define it explicitly again so that we're all on the same page moving forward. You can see down on the bottom I have a graphic representation of the business cycle here in those nice four colors. Um, and starting down the bottom left-hand quadrant, we have phase A, recovery. This is the first phase of the business cycle. And this is the first kind of sign of positivity within the business cycle. Phase A is defined as when your 12-12 is below the zero line. So your sales or your industry or whatever, we'll just say sales from now on, um, are contracting on a year-over-year -year basis. So your most recent year of data is below the year-ago level. Things aren't great. Profits are down. But that 12-12 was rising up toward the zero line. Uh, I like to consider this the light at the end of the tunnel phase because this is when you finally see that pace of contraction starting to slow. When that 12-12 upward passes the zero line, you transition over to that green segment of this business cycle, and that's phase B, accelerating growth. Uh, this is the best phase of the business cycle. This is when your 12-12 is above the zero line and it's rising, so you're expanding on a yearly basis. Your sales are up. Uh, and they're rising at a faster and faster pace on a month-to-month -month basis. Obviously, as much as we would like to, we can't stay in phase B of the business cycle for any uh, you know, definite period of time, or indefinite period of time, I should say. And once that 12-12 peaks and it reaches the top and starts to decline, we've transitioned over to phase C, slowing growth. Slowing growth is what I like to consider the cautionary phase of the business cycle. Things are still good. Sales are still up. You're still making money. People are happy. They're getting those raises they want. However, the rate of growth is slowing on a monthly basis. Things are getting progressively less good as we move through on a month-to-month -month basis. I like to consider phase C the cautionary phase of the business cycle because this is when uh, you know, some serious managerial decisions have to be made. As you're looking at your internal rates of change, as you're looking at your sales numbers, your bookings, your leading indicators as well, you have to ask yourself, does the backside of this business cycle look recessionary? If it looks that way and your 12-12 falls below the zero line, obviously we've transitioned into phase B, recession of the business cycle. Uh, you know, with 2008 still fresh in our minds, even a decade later, I, I'm sure I don't need to uh, explain phase D recession to you in depth. <coughs> And this is what we would consider a hard landing. It's where you transition directly from phase C into phase D uh, with no sustained period of uh, rise on the horizon. However, as is often the case, especially during times of uh, acquisitionary times, new product releases, or within uh, periods of macroeconomic expansion in general uh, in the economy, you can have what we consider a soft landing. And this is where your 12-12 is declining, you're in that phase C trend, but your 12-12 reaches a trough and begins to rise again before hitting that phase D recessionary trend. This is what we call a soft landing, where you transition directly from phase C back to phase B. Again, very important because there are two sets of managerial activities that you have to take uh, if you expect a hard landing or a soft landing. Uh, those are two different operational environments, and you have to have overall two different separate strategies in general for those situations. And we'll touch more on that later as we go through some of the industries of note for you. Up on my screen here now I have U.S. industrial production. Um, I'm showing you this slide to essentially highlight our long-term macroeconomic outlook for the U.S. economy as a whole. We do use U.S. industrial production as one of our primary benchmarks for the U.S. economy, uh, that coupled with GDP. U.S. industrial production comprises three main components. There's mining, manufacturing, and utilities. Right now, of the three of those, mining and manufacturing are expanding on a year-over-year -year basis, and they're a nice phase B accelerating growth trends. Uh, however, we're seeing some nascent signs of weakness in the utilities. If you Think back to last quarter, you know we were right on the cusp of a phase A to phase B transition. U.S. industrial production was just about even with the year ago level at just about 0%. Um, and things have been progressing nicely since then. In the last quarter, uh, we have seen a definitive transition to phase B accelerating growth in line for long-term expectations for the U.S. industrial sector. If you look at the light blue lines on the right side of that year-over-year -year growth rate chart, you will see that our current outlook is calling for accelerating growth to persist through the first quarter of 2018. 
We expect to finish 2017 up 2.2% uh, growth, which is healthy but modest growth. Uh, and then again, followed by a phase C transition in 2018. So we expect growth to begin to slow in 2018, where you'll see those first signs of kind of cautionary growth. However, 2018 as a whole will finish up about one percentage point, followed by a mild consumer-driven recession in 2019 that we're expecting, um, dependent on how you relate directly to U.S. industrial production, the majority of 2019 will feel recessionary for you, uh, but it's going to be the second and third quarters, really that middle half of the year, uh, that's going to see the uh, kind of the, the deepest decline or the, uh, the depths of the recessionary period. Again, this is going to be relatively minor with the year finishing down just about 1.2%, essentially nullifying the growth that we saw in 2018. Now, when we talk about our long-term forecast outlook, when we talk about, uh, you know, our expectations for the U.S. economy marching up to four to six months, uh, four to six quarters, for example, uh, it's important that you don't just take my word for it. I'm essentially just a talking head right now, um, and you don't have to take me on faith. Instead, we can look at the key ITR leading indicators. First off, you can see the U.S. total industry capacity utilization rate. Uh, this is essentially a, an index that attempts to uh, measure how much of the machinery, how much of the equipment that is in the overall U.S. is being used in any given month. Uh, it is currently in a phase C, slower growth trend. It's a little bit to see because it was a mild trend. However, leading between six to nine months for the overall U.S. economy, this supports our expectation of upward momentum for U.S. industrial production and for any segments of the economy or any uh, companies, for example, PMMI, um, that match well with U.S. industrial production through the first quarter. That kind of nascent curl over in the total industry capacity utilization rate is support our expectations of slower growth. And so that's a positive development because essentially it says that what we've been talking about for the last two to three to four or five quarters even um, is taking place as expected. And this is one of the first leading indicators that we would expect to see curling over supporting that uh, phase C cautionary growth phase in 2018. Additionally, oops, and this one's not sliding over, I apologize for that. Um, so you're going to have to use a little bit of imagination and bear with me as you shift this orange uh, line about you know, half an inch over to that recessionary period on the chart for you. Um, this is U.S. industrial production compared to the ITR proprietary leading indicator. The ITR leading indicator, again, uh, leads the industrial sector by about six to nine months. Uh, in the last quarter, we have seen three months of sustained rise, another positive indicator coming from the actual economic data uh, that is suggesting growth through at least the first quarter of 2018. Um, and similarly, it looks like the Purchasing Managers Index doesn't want to slide over visually for us either. I apologize for that. The Purchasing Managers Index, uh, or PMI as you often hear it called in the news, uh, is a great indicator to look at when you're looking at the kind of 12-month, kind of one-year outlook for the U.S. industrial economy because it's based on a survey that's sent out to purchasing executives that asks them about current market conditions and current corporate conditions. Uh, what I mean by that is it asks them about profitability, whether it's up or down compared to the last month. It asks them about inventories. It asks them about rates of new orders, sales, things like that that are actual, real, quantifiable economic data. It's important to note that while this is a survey, um, it's not based on how these executives feel or what they think is going to happen because obviously that can be very misleading. If you were with us uh, during last quarter's market forecast update, uh, you did hear that the PMI curled over in line uh, with our expectations of an early 2018 cyclical peak for U.S. industrial production. But you can see that in the last three months, we saw two months of actually pretty sustained rise before it has once again curled over. Based on the data we've been looking at, we do expect that this phase C transition will persist, that it will uh, transition back to curling over as we expected. But with that 12-month outlook, this is actually signaling that there might be more robust growth on the horizon for us. Uh, and that this uh, accelerating growth that we're expecting could persist into uh, mid to late 2018 as well. 
Now, it's important to mention that when we are looking at leading indicators, either for uh, judging company sales or an industry or the economy as a whole, um, we always look at baskets of leading indicators. We like to look at five to seven for any given industry uh, because at any given time, one leading indicator may be giving what we consider a false signal. We'll see some aberrant behavior, it jumps up, it jumps down, for example. And until we see corroborating evidence in the other leading indicators, you don't want to make any operational or managerial changes to your outlook because, again, you don't want to act on bad data. Now, it's too early, again, to see if uh, this jump in the PMI that we expected uh, is you know, bad data or something aberrant, or if it is a stronger, longer trend within the U.S. economy. And we'll have to wait and see what the other leading indicators have to say over the next one to two quarters. Uh, but if anything, it is showing some upside potential to 2018, which uh, after 2016 is uh, very good for all of us to hear and news that I'm happy to present. Chris, this is Rebecca. Um, it does appear that the slides are uh, populating correctly. Uh, we should be on the U.S. non-defense capital goods new orders slide now. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yep. It does appear to be uh, populating correctly. If anybody has any issues seeing any of the slides, please leave a comment in the bottom right hand of the screen, and I will see if I can get that corrected for you. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, please don't hesitate to speak up. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page here and looking at the same data, uh, lest we confuse each other. So as Rebecca pointed out, now we're looking at U.S. non-defense capital goods new orders. Um, again, this is kind of a confusing term here, but what this is is B2B activity. This is capital investment, business investment. The reason I'm showing you this is because it has recently transitioned to phase B, accelerated growth. You can see in this light white line, which is a little difficult, the 312 quarterly growth rate as a more reactive metric. Uh, you can see that it is outperforming the 1212, suggesting that we are seeing another at least one to two quarters of economic momentum within the business to business sector. And this is important to note because really over the last two years, especially as we move through the commodity price crash of 2015 and 2016, where we saw metal prices tank, where we saw obviously uh, oil prices fall through the floor, um, one of the sectors that was really hit was capital investment. Uh, people weren't buying large machinery. They weren't buying farm combines. They weren't buying long-range hauling trucks if they could help it. They weren't buying new mill equipment because the pricing level had dropped so hard and that we saw that deflationary environment when it came to the standard industry sector that the return on investment on those pieces of equipment that cost $50,000, $200,000, even $400,000 simply wasn't there. And one of the reasons we saw that rise in the capacity utilization rate is because corporations were being forced to learn to do more with less. They were running their machines hot. They were running them uh, you know, at a, in a more aggressive pace for longer. Uh, and we're finally seeing some of those pressures ease. Steel prices are back up, copper prices up, uh, oil you know, moderately rising, for example. Inflationary pressures are taking hold. And that's helping to stimulate capital investment. And this reinvestment in our productive stock within the U.S. economy is one of those factors that's driving manufacturing growth in overall industrial rise right now. So again, another positive development since the last quarter. And in general, uh, I hope you walk away from this presentation with a fairly optimistic outlook because uh, the majority of the leading indicator evidence, the majority of the indicators that we're looking at here today uh, are suggesting that things are strictly better than they were a quarter ago and they're looking good through 2018 as well. And now here we have U.S. gross domestic product and there's a little bit of a dichotomy between the industrial sector and a lot of the pain that uh, you and your colleagues may have felt over the last two years and what the data is saying when it comes to gross domestic product or GDP as it's commonly called. Uh, it is the most holistic capture of economic activity within any uh, nationality. It essentially sums up everything that we buy and sell and produce within a country. And you can see if you look on the left, we have the 12 MMT, so the actual dollar value. Uh, and the last time that we saw that dip for any significant period of time was in uh, 2009 in the wake of the financial crisis. Since then, we've seen almost nine years of sustained economic growth, consistent year-over-year -year growth. The reason I point this out is because 
you know, nine years of positivity, nine years of expansion isn't what a lot of you have felt, and it isn't what you hear a lot of times from, you know, major news outlets, from major um, talking heads and political pundits. They talk about, uh, you know, the weakness within the American economy, they talk about the slack, but it is important to realize that we have seen some fairly sustained, if not always rapid, growth over the last nine years. We expect 2017 to finish up not quite 2, 3%, 2.5% to 2.8%, again followed by slower growth through to, uh, 2018. And on a GDP basis, that recession that we're seeing in the industrial sector is really just going to be about zero growth. It's going to come to a stop for a bit but not contract. And the reason for that is important to realize. When it comes to the disparity between U.S. industrial production and GDP as a whole, we want to break down some of the major uh, spending groups within the U.S. economy. So here we have U.S. GDP by consumption. At 16% in the red, you see business investment. That's that non-defense capital goods new orders that's been hurting over the past two years, but it's finally gaining some steam. After that, we have government spending at 17% of the overall U.S. economy. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons that we always get to see sustained economic growth is because you can always uh, count on the government to spend our money when they need to. But finally, 67%, over two-thirds of the U.S. economy as a whole, is dictated by personal consumption. So that's, you know, what we spend at Walmart, that's what we spend on Amazon, at the gas station, every, all of the things, all the money that comes out of our pocket that we use to buy things with, that's personal consumption. So consumer activity makes up over two-thirds of U.S. total economic growth. And the consumer has been doing pretty good. Uh, here we can see uh, a graph of U.S. private sector employment and millions of jobs. So this is the total jobs within the private sector of the U.S. economy. This excludes uh, farms and government jobs for anyone who's curious about how the data is aggregated. Uh, and you can see that it's been rising consistently since 2009, again, since that last economic recession. Uh, and in fact, it is at record levels. Job growth is currently in phase C, it's slowing a little bit, but it's up 1.7% year over year, pretty healthy. Uh, job openings are in phase B, accelerating growth, and they're up almost 3%, which is excellent news for the U.S. economy. What that says is that the labor market is still tightening. Right? Uh, we are adding more jobs, we're trying to fill more positions than U.S. consumers can actually take right now, suggesting that uh, upward pressures are going to be seen on wages. Uh, but also, it's saying that involuntary part-time employment, also known as part-time employment for economic reasons, um, is currently in phase D recession. And if you remember three months ago, uh, it's been in recession for the last almost five months. That's great because these part-time employment for economic reasons jobs, you want to think of these as your cashier jobs, your fast food jobs, your low-level retail jobs that aren't necessarily economically viable in the long run and people generally take as kind of a last resort when they can't find something else. So that phase B job opening and that phase D involuntary part-time employment is really saying that uh, you know, those of us who want jobs, U.S. consumers who want jobs, are finding jobs, and the jobs they're finding are pretty good jobs. However, the quit rate is also rising, and again, it's been rising for some time now. Uh, consumers are becoming, or laborers, I should say, are becoming more secure in their positions. Uh, they're seeing these uh, unemployment rates fall through the floor. They're hearing about, you know, rising wages. They're hearing about people getting promotions at other places. Uh, in the danger of them becoming unemployed for a long time, long-term unemployment from quitting their job, is going down. So they're moving into that city that's been attractive to them for cultural reasons or nightlife, uh, or they're you know, raising a family and moving out to the suburbs where they know they can find a job, they don't need to be in an economic hub anymore. Uh, or they're going to a competitor who's offering more competitive pay. So very good for the U.S. employee. And you can see here why U.S. median weekly earnings deflated, so that means accounting for interest, uh, are rising and they're near their record levels. Uh, they ticked down in the last quarter or so, but you can see that these are pretty seasonal and they tend to do so moving into the winter months. Uh, but as that quit rate rises, as median weekly earnings go up, uh, I hope most of you are thinking, oh no, that's not great. Because again, as 
median weekly earnings go up, as wages go up, that means that you're paying more out of pocket, your profitab uh, profitability gets impacted. As well, as the quit rate rises, you start seeing retention issues in an already tight labor market where it's very difficult to get skilled labor. These are what I consider positive problems. They are a result of economic expansion. They are a result of the average American doing better than they were last year. However, again, they also come with some downside risks to corporate operations. And it's vital that you keep these in mind, you keep the upside in mind, and you plan for sustained growth uh, you know, while also accounting for or mitigating some of these negative headwinds that come with such growth. And now earlier, uh, you know, I told you that uh, you might be confused to have seen, you know, prolonged economic growth based on what you're hearing in the news. Um, and so this is another, what I like to consider narrative that we hear very often in the political scene, that we hear very often at newspapers, news shows, the death of American manufacturing. You know, it's almost, you want to put it in all caps, like it's its own entity at this point. And you can see here, corroborated in green, we do have manufacturing employment compared to private sector employment in orange. And while private uh, sector employment is nearing or at record levels, uh, manufacturing employment is actually near record lows. So this dichotomy here, right, people are finding jobs, but those jobs aren't manufacturing jobs. In fact, we're losing manufacturing jobs really does feed into that narrative, hey, American manufacturing is dying. You know, we only have half the manufacturers that we used to 20 years ago. Well, as is oftentimes the case with economic data, it's not that cut and dry. And the reason I say that is here you have U.S. total manufacturing production. So as opposed to how many people we employ in the manufacturing realm, this is how much stuff we actually make, right? How much output we put into the nation and the world as a whole. Again, it is rising. Uh, we saw a stronger than average seasonal rise this year, uh, which is a good sign, showing that that factory employment is finally picking up. Um, and it's just about at the peak level that we saw in the run-up to the 2008 recession. So again, we're actually making almost as much stuff, uh, as many manufactured goods, as we have at any other time in history, including what is widely seen as you know, a nationwide bubble in 2008. So why the difference here? How do we rectify losing a significant amount of manufacturing jobs while also nearing record output? Well, it comes down to the fact that we are a capital-intensive manufacturing society. Uh, and what that means is that we rely on high-tech goods, we rely on cutting-edge practice, uh, practices, both, uh, again, um, technological and operationally, uh, to make our stuff. That's how we compete on the global stage. The converse of that is a labor-intensive manufacturing society. That's your China, that's your Southeast Asia, that's your Mexico. That's where instead of investing large amounts in capital goods and equipment and machinery and technology and process streamlining, they invest in laborers. They have lots of people who do low-skill, large-volume work. And it's important that you keep that in mind, that we are a capital-intensive society. Because what I have here is the 2016 Global Manufacturing Competitiveness Index. Uh, this is uh, sourced from Deloitte, based on some research they did. And it goes to show, essentially, who the most competitive producers are on the world stage. As of the end of 2016, you can see that China took the number one spot at a perfect 100 on the index. Uh, the U.S. and Germany falling up closely behind. However, what they also found is that when it comes to determining uh, global competitiveness on a manufacturing basis, talent is the most important uh, driver of a country's ability to compete. That's what sets you apart. The creme de la creme is the talent and the people that you have. And as I said before, we are a capital-intensive society which also means that we invest much more resources in our workers. Um, people who work on manufacturing lines in the U.S. Uh, are much well versed, in, much more well versed, excuse me, in um, software, in running automation, in repairing uh, automatic equipment, for example. And they also tend to be much more educated. That's a plus in our favor in the long run. After that comes cost competitiveness. How cheaply can you do things? 
we don't win there. We pay our workers well. We have strong social security nets, for example. Um, you know, we guarantee a certain wage, and all that drives up our costs. But again, that's only the second most influential driver. By 2020, the United States is poised to knock China off of their pedestal, and actually by a larger margin, and take back that number one manufacturing trophy, essentially. And the reason I want to say that is, again, it's to kind of eschew the headlines, uh, don't worry about what the talking heads are saying so much, but instead look at the actual data. We are still a global manufacturing powerhouse, and in the long run, we are, have the demographics and we have the people to be poised to become the single most competitive manufacturer in the world. So when people talk about India, China knocking us out, they are only falling down that list barring massive structural change within their politics and their economics. And now, with the developments over the last month or two, especially when we come talking to manufacturing, and before we jump into commodity prices and where they're going, um, you know, we hear a lot of questions and we have to discuss the hurricane season. Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma. Um, obviously, tragedies of an incalculable nature, the loss of life, the loss of security, loss of possessions, um, but moving away from that, we are the dismal scientists as economists, so our job is to look at the impacts of these tra tragedies on an impersonal basis and try and quantify that. Well, when we look at a bad hurricane season, the first thing we think to benchmark against is Hurricane Katrina. We look back and what we saw ultimately was a regional impact to GDP. Um, even as bad as Katrina was, which uh, Harvey and Irma aren't looking to, uh, you know, kind of pass muster in that regard, thankfully, uh, Hurricane Katrina wasn't enough to move the national GDP uh, ticker in any direction sustainably for any serious period of time. Oil and natural gas prices spiked as the Gulf got hit, um, but they normalized within three to five months mostly, and in fact, we're already seeing energy prices and oil and gas prices stabilize already within just one or two months. So primarily, the importance of dealing with hurricane season is dealing with supply chain disruptions. If you sell into the Gulf region, uh, you know, you're going to need to account for the fact that they're going to be strapped for cash as they, uh, as they rebuild. If you buy from the Gulf region, you're going to have to start looking for other suppliers if your supply chain has been hit. But more importantly, Dealing with hurricanes shouldn't be, or any natural disaster, shouldn't be a reactionary environment. It shouldn't be something that you look after the fact and say, huh, yep, I have to deal with that. Instead, this is an opportunity to uh, harden your supply chains, to broaden your customer base, because hurricanes are a fact of life. They will come again. I can't tell you when. Uh, you know, weathermen are uh, regarded as probably the only more reviled forecasters and economic forecasters, so it's always nice to take a shot at them. Um, but hurricane season will hit with a vengeance again, and you have to make sure that your supply chains and your consumer base is able to withstand that blow at least for two quarters, because that's generally how long we take to see economic activity get back up on its feet. And as I mentioned before, with the, the resurgence in industrial production and the improvement in uh, returns in the manufacturing realm, Commodity prices are up. Uh, we've seen this chart before, no surprise here. Copper, zinc, aluminum, lead, tin, steel, all up on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, but importantly, over the last quarter, we've seen these rates of change curl over. They're moving back toward the zero line. What that means is that we've already seen the lion's share of gains in the majority of base metal uh, commodities over the last six months. The second half of 2017, and really the last quarter of 2017, I should say, Followed by early 2018, we'll see some rise in commodity prices, but it will be more of a stabilization than we're used to in the last six months. And obviously that's important because as commodity prices rise, as oil and gas and energy prices tick back up, as wages rise, uh, we see inflation. Here we have the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, that's in orange, and then the PPI, the Producer Price Index, in blue. The consumer price index is basically an inflation index used to measure um, how much more it costs for, for an end user to buy something, for example, uh, food or gas or uh, an iPhone, uh, whereas the PPI is how much more it costs for a producer to buy their input materials. 
So when you see this blue rising at 3%, that's essentially a 3% hit to your bottom line. The CPI and the PPI are much watched by the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve Board, FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. Um, these are the guys head by, uh, headed by Janet Yellen who are in charge of setting interest rates and kind of deliberating over long-term interest rate environments within the U.S. Uh, you can see in blue what we saw last quarter. We have a projection for interest rates in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, and beyond. Uh, for each one of these members, we're in orange. We have it as of September. Uh, importantly, this needle hasn't changed. You know, there's been a little bit of fluctuation, but we expect rising interest rates in 2018 before stabilizing in 2019 and beyond around 3%. Uh, that is a radical divergence from the low interest rate kind of quantitative easing environment that we've seen since about 2010 or so. And the reason I bring that up, again, is because we're seeing inflation rise through 2018. We are seeing uh, interest rates rise essentially indefinitely until something happens in the economy that makes them rethink their long-term view. Uh, and we're seeing commodity prices and uh, wages rise. All of those things that impact, impact your profitability as an employer, as a producer, are not only taking hold, but are going to be accelerating through the majority of 2018. And if you don't account for that, at best you'll be growing your top line just as fast as your bottom line gets hurt. You'll see basically zero profitability despite sales and revenue rise as the economy expands through 2018. You have to find ways to pass off these costs or mitigate them. Whether that is passing the costs on to your consumer, uh, by essentially uh, guaranteeing them that it's worth it, right? That's what we call finding and marketing your competitive advantage. What makes me want to buy from you regardless of price? Uh, or it could be through investing in operational efficiencies, cross-training your employees, finding ways to do more with less, to cut down on those costs. And again, so we've gone through, you know, a fairly optimistic worldview as far as the U.S. economy is concerned, really throughout 2018. Uh, but there are some lingering concerns. Uh, the dollar is still strong. Uh, it slid a little bit during the last quarter, which gave some relief to U.S. exporters. Uh, but the market fundamentals really don't show that dollar weakening significantly against its major trading partners next year. Uh, so if you sell into foreign markets, you're going to see some price com uh, competition from the euro, uh, from the yen, from the yuan, for example, the peso. Uh, that's, that's not going anywhere. That's something that you're going to have to continuously fight in order to remain competitive. Uh, again, positive business cycle problems, wages, labor retention, rising input costs, all of these things that come with the thumbs up, you know, phase B macroeconomic expansion aren't going anywhere. And if you've been ignoring them up until now, you have to act before 2018 hits. Otherwise, you risk, uh, uh, risk losing out on all those returns compared to your competitors. Uh, South American stability is being called into que uh, question. We've seen the riots in Venezuela, the uh, Petrobras scandals in Brazil, um, both in pretty significant recessions right now. If you're selling into South America, um, it's going to be a tough climate over the next year or so. Uh, these countries, which are some of the largest in South America, have significant political and structural reforms that they have to go through before they become viable end-use markets for most major U.S. producers. Uh, so if you're exposed to these guys, it's going to be, it's going to be tough for a year or two. Uh, and you have to start thinking about um, either finding ways, again, to reduce costs to make yourself viable in-nation, um, we're finding other major trading partners to try and diffuse that weakness. And then ultimately, in this one again, we've been talking about really all year, lingering global uncertainty, um, NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, that's been on the chopping block for a while since uh, President Trump took office. Uh, it's looking like changes will be made to NAFTA. If it was ripped up in its entirety, I would list that as something that is very concerning um, for the North American uh, economy as a whole. We've seriously benefited from cheaper goods that have helped us, again, remain cost competitive uh, and keep those inflationary, inflationary pressures down by dealing with our major trading partners, by letting Canada and Mexico do what they do best, buying their goods and doing what we do best. Um, but it's yet to be seen if any changes to NAFTA may in fact be a net benefit for the U.S. That's something that we're going to have to sit and see and see what comes out of Washington. 
Um, Brexit and really anti-globalism in general is something that we've been following uh, throughout 2017, 2016 to a lesser extent. Um, and that's really not going anywhere. Again, uh, any decline in globalism is likely going to hike prices, reduce purchasing power, and, and ultimately lead to a global drag. And now that we've gone through kind of the broad strokes of the U.S. economy, I want to jump into some of the industries of note that we prepare for you in your PMMI quarterly update. Uh, here we have food and foods preparation production, uh, currently up 2.5% year over year. It is in a phase C trend, but it's moving to the side more than it's moving down. Uh, it's actually been outperforming our expectations during the last quarter. Our long-term outlook remains in place, but if you're involved in the food packaging industry, you're likely going to see a boom. Um, through the rest of 2017 into early 2018. Most importantly, uh, we're going to finish 2018 down, uh, up, excuse me, 1.2%, and we're not forecasting a recession moving through 2018 into 2019. Uh, a lot of the strong consumer trends uh, that we've been following, those wages and all of that, have put money in the U.S. consumer's pocket, and when the U.S. consumer has money in their pocket, they eat and they buy food. Uh, so again, if you're in this industry, it's a, a good outlook for the next three years. Things will slow in 2018 into early 2019 before ticking back up at the end of the year. Beverages, coffee, and tea production. Uh, you'll see here on our charts that we have an orange line and a blue line. There was a significant uh, Federal Reserve Board data revision to many uh, data series that we follow uh, since the last report. You can see in orange uh, what the previous data trend looked like, what those previous trends were, followed by in blue where they at now. It was on the back side of the business cycle as of last quarter, a phase C decelerating growth trend, but their uh, historical data revision did pull it into phase D recession. On the plus side, it is rising, it is in that phase A recovery trend, and we still expect it to finish up two percentage points year over year at the end of 2017. So the momentum and the timing has changed, but ultimately our expectations for year end aren't radically altered, followed by accelerating growth throughout 2018 uh, and slower growth moving into 2019. We will look at some minor possible recessionary pressures moving to the end of 2019, early 2020, uh, but right now it looks like it will suffer from a relatively soft landing. Pharmaceutical and med device production. Uh, again, you can see these orange lines. I won't call them into, into question again unless they were significant. You can see that the trend remained relatively unchanged. It didn't seriously threaten our long-term outlook. Currently in phase D recession, down two percentage points year over year. Going to finish the year down, but in phase A recovery, followed by acceleration through 2018 into early 2019. Uh, area of concern, we will see another recessionary period moving into 2019 in line with the macro economy. Uh, so if you sell into the, the med, the med device uh, area, it is going to be a story of really maximizing your returns in 2018 in order to not only recoup your losses this year, but also shield yourself from the recession that's coming in 2019. Of note, however, during that recessionary period, the 12 MMT uh, will remain above the current level, uh, so it won't nearly be as severe as what we've seen over the past year. Very similar trend here in a related market, U.S. personal care products production. Uh, this is more, if you imagine, med device that is sold into a CVS or a Walgreens or a local pharmacy. Currently in phase D recession, down about 2.8 percentage points year over year. Recession will persist through early 2018 before acceleration takes hold, finishing up the year about 2.5 percentage points. Uh, and again, we're forecasting a very mild recession moving into 2019. Uh, so, so marketing your advantages, really capturing market share in 2018 as things pick up is going to uh, be key to maintaining a long-term strategic position in this market as you move into 2019. Chemicals and cleaning products production. This includes your soaps, your bleaches, as well as your industrial chemicals. Uh, currently in phase B, accelerating growth, up 1.8% year over year. We sell, uh, expect that acceleration to persist into 2018, finishing 2017 up 3%, uh, followed by uh, recessionary pressures brewing by the end of 2018, and a very mild recession uh, throughout the majority of 2019. Important to note that if you look at the 12 MMT, any recession here is really going to feel more like a market stagnation. 
and simply suggests that uh, you know, you'll have to strive a little bit harder and invest a little bit more in order to capture market share as the economic road really won't be rising up to meet you as you progress through late 2018 and 2019. Durables, hard goods, components, and parts production, another kind of mouthful of a term. Uh, but basically, this is any good that lasts for more than three years, um, be it machinery parts, be it automotive parts, be it kitchenware, uh, computers, for example. Furniture is another big one. Uh, currently in phase B, accelerating growth, but it's really moving sideways and will continue to do so throughout 2017. It'll mostly avoid recession. There might be some minor headwinds that you encounter over the next three quarters before things pick up through the majority of 2018. Uh, again, minor forecast in 2019, but it's important that you kind of lead with optimism in this regard, especially as far as it goes uh, for consumer durable goods, which are outperforming right now. Um, any weakness you see, any tick down in demand is likely going to be temporary, and we expect overall rise throughout 2018. So it's vital that you don't pull back on your uh, production or pull back on your marketing costs until you see prolonged decline in demand moving to the end of 2018. And now that we've taken a dive into some of the key markets in the U.S., I want to spend just a few brief moments zooming out and looking at what some of the global trends have to say. As far as the national le uh, leading indicators, OECD plus six, that's the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, uh, essentially some of the more industrialized nations in the world, the major Asian, Brazil, Canada, China, India, Japan, all up, uh, all between six to 12 months uh, of positive momentum for these industrial production indices uh, as far as the leading indicators go. The PMIs look out a little further, still up, but you can see that they are turning that corner just like we expect to see in the U.S. PMI, suggesting that the slower growth trend in 2018 and those recessionary pressures that we expect to be brewing in 2019 are going to be a global event, mild, nothing to be overtly concerned about, but they will be a global event. When it comes to North America, a lot of green, again, leading with optimism from the U.S. through 2018. Canada up 4%, Mexico lagging a bit behind, but we do expect 2018 to be a growth year with them. Um, plan to see some uh, marginal capital investment uh, or some slowing capital investment in Mexico over the next six months to a year. Uh, as again, some possible concerns about opening up factories with the potential of uh, border taxes and NAFTA being wrapped up, uh, or ripped up, I should say, are still on the table. But overall, the economic growth will return in 2018 um, but again, stay tuned for any potential political developments. Now, with South America, as I mentioned earlier, very much a mixed bag. Argentina, Peru, Colombia doing pretty well. Uh, Brazil, Chile down significantly. Venezuela is taking a hit, although it's not shown here with most recent data. Um, where you see red in South America, there aren't going to be any long-term prospects through 2018. Uh, these recession, uh, recessions are going to be relatively deep and persistent, um, so act with caution if you choose to play in this area. Europe, much more green, uh, you know, great to highlight some of that. Uh, Eastern Europe growing at a much faster clip than Western Europe. You can see 8%, 3%, 5%, 6%, 7% in the east, followed by you know, more lackluster 1, 2, or 3% growth rates uh, in the west. France, notably, uh, one of the laggards at 0.8%. UK at 1.0%, not terrible. Um, those faster growth rates that we look at in Eastern Europe are pretty normal fare for the game. Uh, they are less mature markets and do tend to see faster growth and faster decline moving through the business cycle. Norway, kind of the one significant nation of, uh, of concern. Again, all of the major petro nations are going to have some troubles over the next three or four quarters as they recover from that oil price slump and the lower for longer oil prices that we're looking at. But nothing structurally concerning uh, as far as overall Europe goes moving through 2018. Asia as well, almost all green. Uh, China was, there were some current concerns about Chinese data uh, earlier this year, they were in a phase C slower growth trend, kind of waffling around 6%. Um, they have kicked their economy into gear. Um, their consumers have started purchasing with a gusto. Their central bank has taken some inflationary actions. Uh, and all of that has really driven that phase B accelerating growth trend that we see, coupled with growth in India. Uh, really, as, fa as far as China and India go, if they're doing well, their neighbors are doing well. 
Uh, so Southeast Asia, uh, China, India especially, are going to be growth opportunities through 2018 in line with what we're expecting for the global economy and the U.S. particularly as a whole. Selling into Australia presents a little bit of a risk. Uh, coal is going out the window. It's recently been replaced in the U.S. by natural gas and in many uh, European nations uh, as uh, the primary or the old primary source of energy. Um, it's falling out of favor. Again, natural gas is cheaper, it's cleaner, uh, and it's here to say as the world's major uh, coal exporter, uh, their mining sector is going to, to feel some pain moving into 2018. But overall, we do expect them to transition to the front side of the business cycle by year end 2018. And now finally, if you've been following along uh, this year, this slide hasn't changed uh, really over the last year or so, I think. Uh, actions to take before the 2019 recession. And I'm leaving this here to highlight that manage, managerial acumen, if you want to call it that, has to be an active game as we approach this 2019 recession. It's not enough to know that it's a coming, uh, know that it's coming simply. You have to know that it's coming and do something about it. And these are some of our general management objectives uh, that once you find out your position in the market, where you relate to the major leading indicators, uh, some actions you should take moving through 2018 in order to shield yourself from some of the negative effects. Again, I know we're running up on time here, and this is old hat for many of you. Uh, so I'm going to leave this slide up here, and when it gets distributed, I encourage you all to take a look at it, to disseminate it to uh, your managers, your sales force, really everyone within your corporate structure in order to make sure that you're all on the same page. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back to you, Rebecca, for any questions I can field. Chris, thank you so much for the great reflection of the current economy and issues at hand for packaging and processing industry. Um, like Chris said, we're going to open up the session to questions. Uh, if you have any questions that you'd like to have answered, you may type them in the message or chat box at the bottom right hand side of your screen, or you can press star 2 to unmute your phone, and we'll give it just a moment here to see if any questions come through. I'd like to take this time to note, Rebecca, for everyone involved here, um, if any questions come up uh, with you or your colleagues in the days to come, or Rebecca, upon distribution of these slides, uh, you can always email your questions to us directly uh, at questions at itreconomics.com with the subject header PMMI. Thank you for that, Chris. And if any other questions come up and you by chance don't have um, that email, you can also feel free to email me, Rebecca Mar um, R. Marquez at PMMI.org or Paula Feldman, P. Feldman at PMMI.org with your question and we'll make sure it gets over to ITR um, for Chris to review and, and provide an answer. And it looks like today we don't have any questions, so we can conclude the webinar. Chris, thanks again. This was a really great and comprehensive report. On behalf of PMMI, thanks everyone for participating today. As a final note, you will receive an email to complete an, eva uh, an evaluation on today's webinar. Please take a moment to let us know how we did and if there's any way we can improve the webinar. Um, and that will be posted on PMMI.org. You will also just be receiving an email from me um, for that brief survey. And um, once again, thanks everyone for participating. Have a great day.